Necrosis, the walking dead. Did you think the monsters of Halloween were a myth? The ghosts, zombies with rotting flesh and falling limbs? Mummies or melting brains? Think again. In medical terminology, Halloween equates to necrosis. Warning, do not watch in the dark. The word necrosis is derived from the Greek word necrosis, meaning becoming dead. A severe injury like ischemia, toxin, trauma or infection kills the cell. It is a pathological and uncontrolled kind of cell death in which the membranes fall apart, enzymes leak and digest the cell. A necrotic cell can be likened to a crumbling cookie. Every part of it starts breaking into tiny pieces. Following a damaging stimulus, the cell and organelle membranes break up. Enzymes escape from the lysosomes and start digesting the cell. The cytoplasm initially turns dense eosinophilic as the denatured protein binds strongly to eosin and basophilic RNA is lost. Myelin figures derived from the membrane phospholipids increase in number. Soon the cytoplasm appears moth-eaten. The nuclear changes are due to the destruction of the DNA. They assume three forms, namely pycnosis, shrinkage and darkening, karyorexis, nuclear fragmentation, or karyolysis, a pale blue nucleus due to DNA's activity. Eventually, the nucleus disappears. As the cell crumbles on itself, the contents released elicit an inflammatory reaction. The enzymes from the dying cell or the inflammatory cells may completely digest the cell. Or, more often than ever, the hungry neutrophils and macrophages come into the picture and gobble up the debris in a process called phagocytosis. Sometimes these dead cells are replaced by calcification. This is known as dystrophic calcification, which we will learn about in further sessions. When many such cells undergo necrosis, it can lead to the death of the tissue or the entire organ. Necrosis can have many morphological forms, depending on the type of injury and organ affected. The various types of necrosis are coagulative necrosis, liquefactive necrosis, gangrene, caseous necrosis, fat necrosis, and fibrinoid necrosis. Let us talk about these with examples, starting with coagulative necrosis. It is caused by ischemia in any solid organs, except the brain. An infarct is nothing but ischemic necrosis of tissue. This picture shows a wedge-shaped necrotic area in the kidney due to a blocked vessel. The characteristic feature is the tissue architecture is preserved even after cell death. The anucleate cells preserve their outlines and appear as ghosts of the past. This picture shows the junction between the necrotic and viable kidneys. Even the necrotic tissue shows the preservation of the tubular architecture. This is attributed to the denaturation of the lysozymal enzymes, which usually digest the cell. These cells are finally devoured by phagocytosis. The next type of necrosis is liquefactive necrosis. How gruesome does a melting brain sound? For obscure reasons, ischemia in the brain turns it into a viscous liquid forming abscesses. It can also occur in other parts of the body using a different mechanism. A classic example is an infected abscess in soft tissue filled with pus. The pus is liquefactive necrosis. It is caused by organisms that recruit inflammatory cells, a rich source of enzymes that digest tissue. Gangrene is a commonly used clinical term, but it is not a specific morphological type of necrosis. There are mainly three types, dry, wet and gas gangrene. These differ in pathogenesis and appearance. Dry gangrene is a type of coagulative necrosis caused by a gradual obstruction in arterial supply. An example is dry gangrene of the foot, seen in conditions affecting the vessels, like 
arteriosclerosis, Birger disease, or Raynaud's disease. The limb has a very distinct appearance in this condition. It appears dry, blackened, shriveled, and is referred to as mummified. In a few cases, autoamputation can also take place. There is a clear line of demarcation between the oxygenated and necrosed tissue. I guess those horror movies with walking zombies and dropping limbs had some signs to them. However, in reality, these signs warrant immediate therapeutic intervention to prevent the loss of a limb or superadded infection. Wet gangrene, on the other hand, is a combination of coagulative and liquefactive necrosis. Coagulative necrosis is caused by both arterial and venous obstruction. For example, intestinal gangrene secondary to a strangulated hernia. The bacteria which are normal common cells in the gut turn rogue and cause an infection, leading to liquefaction. The tissue appears soft, swollen, putrid, rotten and dark. This phenomenon can also occur in diabetic foot or bed sores, where blood stagnates, acting as a culture plate for infection and can even lead to septicemia. Another example is noma or cancromoris. It is gangrenous necrosis of the orofacial tissue secondary to fusospirochetal infection, leading to the destruction of large areas of the face. Immunocompromised individuals are more prone to this condition and it was unfortunately commonly seen in malnourished children in the Nazi camps during the Second World War. Summarizing the differences between dry and wet gangrene. Dry gangrene is caused by slow arterial obstruction. Wet gangrene, on the other hand, is due to abrupt arterial and venous obstruction. Dry gangrene mostly occurs in the extremities where the fat and fluid content are less, whereas wet gangrene occurs in viscera, containing plenty of fat and fluid content. Dry gangrene represents coagulative necrosis, whereas wet gangrene is a combination of coagulative and liquefactive necrosis secondary to bacterial infection. There is a clear line of demarcation between oxygenated and ischemic tissue in dry gangrene which is absent in wet gangrene. Dry gangrene appears mummified, with the limb appearing dark, shrunken, shriveled and black, whereas wet gangrene appears boggy, swollen, putrid and rotten. The necrosis spreads slowly in dry gangrene and rapidly in wet. Therefore, prognosis is better in cases of dry gangrene than wet. A less commonly encountered gangrene is gas gangrene, which is a type of wet gangrene caused by Clostridia. It can be seen in open wounds in muscles or the gut. The tissue appears swollen, edematous, painful and crepitant due to the gas bubble formation. Pop quiz Let us move on to another type of necrosis, caseous necrosis. This means cheese-like due to its yellow, crumbly, friable, cheesy nature on gross morphology. This is a picture of a lymph node with areas of cheesy necrosis. You can always count on pathology to ruin your appetite for your favorite food. Say bye-bye to cheese for at least a week. Caseous necrosis is most commonly associated with tuberculosis, where amorphous pink granular necrosed cells and bacteria are surrounded by an inflammatory reaction including macrophages, epithelioid cells, which are modified macrophages, lymphocytes, monocytes, and giant cells called Langham cells. This entire structure is called a granuloma. We will be discussing granulomatous inflammation in further sessions. Fat necrosis, as the name suggests, is the death of fat cells in tissues with high fat content. 
don't get excited. This is not a method for weight loss, but has perilous consequences. It occurs in the peritoneum following acute pancreatitis. The enzymes leak from the pancreas and break down the peritoneal fat. The resultant fatty acids combine with the calcium derived from dead cells to form chalky white areas grossly. This is known as fat saponification. Acute pancreatitis can be life-threatening. Last but not least is fibrinoid necrosis. As the name suggests, the appearance of the necrosis is amorphous and pink in H and E sections and looks like fibrin. This kind of necrosis is seen in blood vessel walls as a result of antigen-antibody reactions and leaked plasma proteins. It is seen in polyarthritis nodosa, a form of immune-mediated vasculitis. Markers of necrosis can be detected in blood tests that can help save lives. Creatine kinase and troponins are enzymes normally present in a cardiomyocyte. In case of a myocardial infarction, the necrosed cells release these enzymes into the bloodstream. If picked up early, immediate intervention can be life-saving. Similarly, liver transaminases are released from necrosed hepatocytes. These are markers of viral hepatitis. Every dying cell lets out a final cry for help, a cry to avenge its murderer. A ghost cell in the kidney, spleen or heart or a dry, shriveled, blackened finger points at a blocked vessel. Fibrin-like material in a blood vessel talks about an ongoing immunological war. Cheesy necrosis identifies its assassin mycobacterium tuberculosis. An abscess filled with pus points towards an infection. Finding the cause of necrosis prevent further cell death with timely therapeutic interventions. Although it might be too late for a liquefied brain on an autopsy table, if necrosis is cellular murder in broad daylight in front of witnesses, what would you call a carefully planned assassination plot or a cell that commits suicide? Look up our next video on apoptosis and how it differs from necrosis. We hope you had fun learning with us.